Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at MoreTech with Steve Crusher, who's going to talk today about thermal guard banding in the field. Heat is obviously a killer of a lot of chips. How do we make sure that we don't exceed the thermal budget in these chips? Yes, yeah, so the, uh, the traditional approach has been to put some sort of thermal diode uh, into the chip, and uh, better than that, uh, an actual thermal sensor with its own uh, ADC architectures uh, and delivering digital data out uh, to a higher accuracy. So yeah, uh, these thermal devices, these thermal sensors are put in as a kind of insurance policy sometimes to prevent the chip from going too high in temperature. But it's also a lot more complicated now with some of the AI chips, uh, some of the more advanced node chips, and even in some of the advanced packages, because now you have multiple interactions that you didn't have in the past, right? Uh, yes, that, that, that's right. Um, and also the environment uh, can have uh, a considerable effect as well. Um, if, for example, uh, you have a, a data center environment where you have multiple chips that are very close to each other within a rack um, and you're having to cool the entire system, what you can see is that whereas traditionally designers used to try and avoid thermal runaway within the chip itself, what we're seeing is that uh, you can go into certain thermal runaway conditions within the system because uh, the thermal dissipation can um, move on to the next chip and the next chip and so on. And then it becomes a thermal runaway uh, challenge for the actual uh, cooling and air conditioning systems uh, within the data center environment itself. So at multiple levels, uh, we're seeing some, some issues thermally. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure, sure. So Steve, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so what we have here is a temperature scale uh, that's representing what the uh, junction temperature or the die temperature is uh, actually within the chip and certain levels at which uh, the software can be programmed to say, well, beyond which, if you go beyond a certain temperature, you're into a, uh, maybe a kind of over temperature limit zone uh, that you don't want to go into, so you want to back things off. Those tolerances are a lot tighter than what they were in the past though too, right? So as you get into more complicated chips, AI chips that are doing a lot of things and always on, those temperatures really are maximum, whereas in the past they were sort of theoretical. Uh, yes, yeah, the, there is a, a very much a strong consideration uh, that if you do go beyond certain temperature limits, uh, you then have the compounding problem of not just the higher temperature, but also the higher leakage within the chip. Uh, which then compounds the problem even more and you get into a thermal runaway situation. And what we see is on the advanced nodes, um, es essentially that becoming more of a, a, a consideration. So how does this play out in the real world? Yeah, so uh, if you're managing temperature on the chip, uh, you may set the maximum limit within the software to be 85 or that's your intended maximum limit. But if you've got a temperature sensor uh, with say, uh, an error or an, an accuracy of plus and minus five degrees C, you need to allow for that. So what we have is, although you're looking for a maximum temperature of 85, allowing for a minus five in accuracy, you're actually setting your software at 80 degrees C here. And what's the impact of doing that? Well, the, the really interesting thing about that is you've had to rein in the margin over which you can operate. And to make things worse, because you've had to set it at 80 to compensate for that inaccuracy, there's still the issue of the die temperature um, potentially uh, being at 75 degrees C, because it's plus or minus five degrees C accuracy, uh, sensing die temperature down here and reading an 80 degrees C value. So yeah, activity and uh, 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 you know, switch off conditions could happen a lot lower. So ideally, what are you trying to get to here? Yeah, so what I'm trying to get to here is that when the temperature rises on the die, quite often um, action will be taken when it reaches a certain limit. So to avoid uh, going beyond that maximum temperature, you may want to reduce the clock frequency, hence reduce the activity on the chip. You may want to reduce the supply slightly to reduce the power. You may want to switch on fans, you may want to switch on cooling, you may want to switch blocks off, and in extreme conditions, you may just want to shut down the chip completely. 
if you think about the, the design teams that are working with this stuff, a lot of times power experts really don't exist in these teams. People understand how to do hardware, they understand how to do software, and they understand how to do some of the layout, but they, the power experts tend to be few and far between. What you're talking about here is actually putting power into the hands of the design team on every level, right? Yeah, that's right. And um, there's certain aspects of this that really need to be understood because um, if you have, say, a slightly less accurate temperature sensor being used for thermal alert, you know, we, we often have um, people who say, well, I'm just using a thermal sensor as a thermal alert. It doesn't need to be accurate. But you have to look at the impact over your entire product range, which is something that I can go into in a little bit more detail. So can you explain how the temperature actually affects the whole product range? Yes, so in this example that I've just given here, um, where I've said that uh, you're setting the software at 80 because you've got to compensate for the inaccuracy, uh, and the die temperature may actually be lower uh, uh, because of its reading uh, and the inaccuracy. So in the field, as temperature rises, you will start to see product in the field, in mission mode, starting to switch off. And that product would be switching off slightly earlier than intended at the, the 80 degrees C. So you could have products switching off as low as 75 degrees C. So you're losing both performance as well as efficiency on power all the way through the system here. A absolutely, and you're also losing product. Uh, so your uh, product that you would hope to be working up to its uh, optimal point in terms of temperature is in fact switching off. And what we can do is, um, what I'd like to do is make a comparison of this plus or minus five degree C accurate thermal sensing uh, model I have here compared to a more accurate uh, thermal sensor. So if we have uh, the example of uh, a more accurate temperature sensor of say plus or minus two degrees C, we then work through the numbers again as we've done before. The maximum limit is 85. We have to allow for uh, the minus two degrees C level. So that will be 83 degrees C level that the software is set to. And then we take into account the inherent inaccuracy. So what we have there is 81 degrees C. And that's the point at which um, the actual junk junction temperature could be and the point at which you know, evasive action is being take, taken by the chip uh, to avoid getting to that higher limit. So how does this actually look for a more accurate sensor? Okay, so what it means in terms of the uh, across the product range is that uh, the point at which you start taking evasive action is a lot later. Um, you know, when you start switching fans on or or reducing clock frequencies, etc., would actually start to occur at this level here. So this is the point at which you start to have silicon uh, switching off to avoid any sort of uh, um, uh, overheating conditions. Now the main point I'm, I'm making here is that there's a difference. So the accurate thermal sensor compared to the less accurate, and the difference is this region here. So we can see that there's a, an amount of product in this region that switches off early in the field and across the product range. Um, and that's, that's a wasted opportunity, essentially. So you can say there's a, a, a lowering of the uh, uh, operational yield of your product by just using a, a less accurate sensor. And this is also really important in something like an automobile, right? Because now you have ambient temperature, which can contribute to the overall temperature of the device. And it can go higher, it can go lower, and it can go fairly fast depending upon where you are. And it's going to be different for each geography. So in the desert versus in uh, uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, yes, and I think if we take a, an automotive example, um, if a chip within the car starts to overheat, uh, you want the car to be pulling over um, when it's getting close to that limit, not like way before it reaches that limit because you want to drive the car further. You don't want to be pulling over all the time. And so this is a good, good example of that. How much overhead is there in this kind of monitoring versus other kinds of monitoring? If you're making comparison um, between things like uh, what traditionally used to be used, just a, a thermal diode, um, there is an overhead with having a, um, a dedicated sensor with you know, 
uh, the ADC architectures and also the, uh, the digital interfacing. So there is that extra overhead. But the reason why that wins out over, say, a simpler thermal diode, which may be a smaller block, is that thermal diodes always need quite extensive characterization to make them anywhere near accurate. So that's been quite a shift over the, over the last sort of, I'd say, sort of couple of decades um, that you know, um, comprehensive thermal sensors are now uh, being more of a requirement. And net-net, because you're picking up some efficiency throughout the whole chip, now is it still, is it in the favor of this is more efficient doing it this way than it would be without these, these monitors? Uh, yes, um, so there's two things there. Um, if we're comparing the diode to a temperature sensor, obviously people don't want to calibrate diodes in a production test environment. It takes a long time. And the other sense to this is that um, it, it's very much, I often relate things to uh, say Formula One engines, where if you had a Formula One engine that had no sensors around it, um, it would pretty much be disastrous consequences. Uh, similar if you have an advanced node chip, you have to have those sensors in place to make uh, some or apply some control over what's going on within the chip. Otherwise you get into uh, quite a um, uncontrolled uh, situation in terms of temperature supplies and basically the longevity um, of devices. So if you're monitoring temperature much more accurately, what does that do for reliability? Uh, so that's a very good question. Um, one of the big considerations at the moment is uh, management of thermal stress and the effects of electromigration over long periods of time. If you can manage that much more tightly, then there's an opportunity to extend the lifetime of a device. So basically reducing the mean time before failure uh, for that device. Steve Crusher, thanks for a great explanation. No problem, thank you Ed.